to the honor of releasing the book. So the book, due to be released shortly, owes its origin to my quest for locating the substantive purpose of public life in the advancement of constitutional ideals at a time when politics and politicians are suspect. Having pursued law and politics for almost all of my adult life, it was only natural for me to reflect on the state of our polity in relation to the dignitarian goals of the Constitution. This enterprise, which seemed a perfect fit for my exertions, is inspired by the belief that in times of test, silence is not an option. In its essence, the book is about the nation's unrequited search for freedom, dignity, and justice for all in the framework of the Constitution. While I will have more to say on the book in a conversation later with Mahesh, let me recall a few lines from the introduction of the book, which I believe in a way summarizes its essence. I quote, we must ask ourselves, if only to address the challenge, whether, given the perceived reversal of history, the liberal story that celebrates the power of liberty will remain the indispensable manual for the future of the world. Let me recall a few lines from the introduction which summarizes, as I believe, its essence, and I quote, we must ask ourselves, if only to address the challenge, whether, given the perceived reversal of history, the liberal story that celebrates the power of liberty will remain the indispensable manual for the future of the world. In these troubled times, when centers have ceased to hold and a dignitarian constitution risks mutilation, People born to freedom have asserted the power of the powerless to preserve their liberty and dignity. In an assertion of self-esteem, in testing moments, we have preferred freedom over identity and subsistence. Faced with heavy odds, the relentless pursuit of dignity and justice admits of no bystanders. Those indifferent to the cause, will not escape culpability. Mahesh Jangarajan Ji, the Bora Sahib, the galaxy of guests here, the father of Chief Justice of India, judges of the Supreme Court, men and women of the media, and stalwarts of Indian politics like Sri L.K. Dwani, Sri When I'm sorry, I've become very emotional in saying something about Mr. Chidhamran, but he remains a very distinguished personality on the Indian political I am indeed very happy to be here this evening for the launch of Sri Ashwin Kumar's new book, Human Dignity, A Purpose in Perpetual. This task was to be performed by the former President of India, Sri Pranav Mukherjee, but as Ashwini told us, he is unwell and therefore I have to act as a substitute for I know I am a poor substitute for the <laughs> illustrious father of the world. 
ladies and gentlemen, for his thoughtful intervention in Parliament and writings on important national issues. At a time when politics in our country has come to be seen as pursuit of power for its own sake, Ashwin's asserts, and rightly so, the need for central centrality of idealism in democratic politics. This book, structured around topical issues, discusses the various facets of human dignity as a core constitutional value. The inadequacies of our legal and political processes to live up to the dignitarian goals of our splendid constitution have been eloquently brought out. The essays in this book remind us that in the troubled times that we live in, the process of democratic erosion can be arrested with the citizens' assertion of constitutional values. Ashwini Kumar makes out a compelling case for preserving freedom and human dignity as the reason the act of democracy. He cautions us against the ravages of ideological access. In recent days, young people across the country have reminded us that freedom is best secured in the custody of enlightened citizens and when it is protected for all. The institutions of our liberal and libertarian democracy have been put to test on several occasions when fundamental freedoms were threatened. These institutions, nurtured over the years, need to be strengthened and must assert themselves in defense of our constitution. This is another important message of the author who has spent a lifetime in the study and practice of law. Indeed, the idea of freedom can acquire shape and form in the lives of our people only if they can live as equal citizens under the law. I would like to compliment Ashwin for reminding us that the quest for freedom, dignity, and justice is a continuing project and a purpose in perpetuity. I believe that all those committed to the ideals of the Republic and dedicated to the preservation of our civilizational values will find the book truly inspiring. With this word, I compliment Ashwin for producing yet another splendid book full of ideas, full of ideas. Mr. Manmohan Singh, <coughs> Honorable Mr. Sari, my good friend Dr. Ashwini Kumar, the author, distinguished members of this audience, political leaders, judges, journalists, advocates, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to congratulate <coughs> Dr. Shwini Kumar for this very brief and beautifully written book of essays published from time to time in the recent past. <coughs> Under the title of Human Dignity. Essentially, as Mandari Saab mentioned just now, 
what he has written about is expression of serious concern to the erosion of the fundamentals of our democratic framework, to the institutions of our democracy, institutions of governance, and a certain trend where the institutions of democracy appear to be under threat. Now, I will not go into the constitutional and judicial aspects of what we have seen in the last many years now. The person who has been involved in administration in the functioning of the system for almost six decades, all I can say is that there has been a continuing decline, erosion, in the functioning of all the organs of the Constitution. The failures of the executive, failures of the legislature, and in more recent times, painful failures of the judiciary. So all in all, we have a situation which creates concern. In this context, I would also like to mention in the past now two decades, almost two decades, after the commencement of the information technology revolution, systems of communication, real-time interactions, and as a result of the growth and development of our country in the last seven decades, a significant increase in longevity, significant increase in the literacy rates, a significant increase in the per capita earnings, the level of awareness of the common man is now not what it was, say, two decades or two and a half decades ago. The print media has always been there, it has expanded. The electronic media, and in more recent times, this small gadget, the mobile telephone, has created virtually a revolution in terms of the awareness of the common man. So it is no longer possible, as we used to do in administration years ago, of taking the man in the street or the village for granted. Every person has the right, as a citizen, to call for the preservation and protection of his fundamental human rights, human dignity, equality, fraternity, all the good words we just now heard. And therefore, it is no longer easy, if I may say so in simple terms, to translate the vision of the Constitution into acceptable levels of society reality, unless the organs of the Constitution work to the optimum, the executive must return to its normal, which I'm afraid there has been a serious decline in the functioning of the public services, the politicization of the officialdom, levels of corruption, unanswerability, <coughs> lack of accountability, now, we have various institutions which have been established over time to deal with these erosions. But the mere creation of these institutions has not led us anywhere. In more recent times, we now have the Lokpal, which we waited for 40 years. Soon enough, hopefully it will start functioning. It's busy at the moment, framing its rules and regulations. So I would not take more time except to say, that Dr. Shwini Kumar's concerns are totally well-founded. We are all responsible, sitting in this room and outside. Every human person, every resident, every citizen has his rights, but also duties. And I'm afraid that the course of the governance of this country in the past seven decades, we have not done enough 
to inculcate, to imbue our coming generations with what they need to do by way of discharging the duty of the citizens. So I think the failure then goes across to another frontier. So all in all, I hope that in the coming time, not only with the publication of this book, but with so much debate, which is ongoing in various arenas of our country, the levels of awareness are now being further enhanced. The student community is also coming to the forefront. So we need to be cautioned if we are to protect and maintain the edifice of our constitution, the constitution and the rule of law, then I think we have to do many things in the coming time with total devotion and recommitment. Once again, my congratulations to Dr. Kumar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ayla Morali. Ladies and gentlemen, judgments of our own Supreme Court. Despite this, it is often violated with impunity by the state and its agents. Secondly, there is a certain sequencing in the principles listed in the preamble of our Constitution. Justice, liberty, equality and fraternity and within each one of these principles. Thus, political justice is unachievable without economic justice. That in turn necessitates social justice. The same holds for other values to be secured for all citizens. Thirdly, dignity for the individual is achieved through fraternity. That in turn is achieved through the rights listed before it. Fraternity between those who are not equal in status and rights is at best charity, which is voluntary and is not a right. Fourthly, we take pride in the instrumentalities of the Constitution which has created for the dispensation of justice. The citizen, however, is baffled when these instrumentalities are deactivated by delay. This gap has to be closed. Considerations of statecraft of the day are best kept away from the administration of justice. And fifthly, India is undergoing a transformation and the young generation has its own vocabulary for seeking dignity in the structuring of their future. We need to understand it and accommodate it. As an eminent academic wrote last week, that, and I quote him, over time, governments everywhere have learned that the anger or wrath of students is something that even authoritarian regimes cannot afford.